Well, all right, all right, all right. What's going on, everybody? Jay here again. We're back with the coffee and cigars and our Thursday night hang here every Thursday night on the Ono Live channel from 8 p.m. till about, I don't know, 10 p.m. or average. How y'all doing today? Welcome back. Good to see you. It is Thursday, August 24th, and we are here. Is that too loud? Is this music? I don't know. I don't know. I can never tell. I can never tell. But anyway, we're back here again, and we've got a, a nice show for you today. We've got uh, some coffee, some cold brew coffee that I've been working on. And then we've also got a nice cigar that I picked up while I was in Philadelphia a couple weeks ago watching Oppenheimer. And uh, we're going to get into all of that in just a moment. So how y'all doing this week? It's, a, it's been a nice kind of mild, cool-ish day here in Baltimore. Like right now it's relatively cool outside, but it's still a little bit warm here in the studio because, you know, the concrete slab of this building is still hot so it's like oh man but it's it's not too bad it's not too bad it's not too bad we're gonna see how it goes and hopefully it'll be a nice time what's going on mom how's things in new york good to have you here with us always good to see you always good to see you. if you're joining us also drop me a comment so that i know you're there and uh we can say hello to you and you know especially if you're new to the show let me know and if you as we go along if you have any questions or comments, put them here. Or if you're watching the replay, put them down below. All right. So, so today for our coffee segment, I'm doing this event tomorrow on Saturday. At so, my former manager and one of my and roaster and you know right hand general right hand person Sarah Walker has you know, she left me quite a number of years ago, probably 2014 or 2015, to start her own thing. And she started her own company called Vent with a, a part business partner. A uh, guy named Andrew, and uh, they're celebrating their fifth anniversary this year. So very excited! And, and she called me up, and she's like, "Hey, would you be interested in in joining this cold brew competition?" And I was like, "Sure." Well, what's it all about? She's like, "It's basically all different roasters will come, prepare samples of cold brew, serve them to the guests, and then it's kind of like a people's choice, you know, award as to who's going to win." And I was like, yeah, I'd be happy to do that. She's also like, oh, would you mind? We're doing a, a latte art throwdown. Would you mind judging it? And I was like, of course, happy to do it. Happy to do it. I'm in town. I'm happy to come and support your event. Very excited that, that they're doing well. And so I decided, I was thinking about what am I going to prepare? Now, we, we normally have this coffee that I have made for us in Nicaragua. What's going on, George? Good to see you. How you doing? How's everything down there in Arlington, Falls Church or... Maybe tonight you're in uh, Bethesda. Anyway, so this coffee is made in Matagalpa. So if you're not too familiar with, with, with uh, Nicaragua, Matagalpa is about three hours outside of Manawa. And it's kind of in the same general vicinity as Esteli, where we get a lot of our cigars from. So usually when I go down to Matagalpa, I'll usually make a quick trip over to Esteli for a day, hang out and, uh, you know, Either get some boots made, maybe eat a steak and uh, smoke cigars, you know, or visit cigar factories. But anyway, so about in 2015, I think it was, the Star Chefs International Chefs Congress asked me to come and do a presentation uh, of drinks. And I was like, I'd be, I was happy to because they gave me an award the year before. So I was like, well, of course, I'm going to help you out and, and uh, have that opportunity. And so it was kind of a question: of what, were we gonna, what were we going to do? We took that we had at the time we had this really wonderful coffee from Costa Rica, this SL28 from a place called um, Urba Zoo. Beautiful coffee, super floral, really, really lovely. And we thought, I thought we were talking about what we were going to do for this event, this Chefs Congress. And I was like, then we decided that let's take this coffee, cold brew it, and then it was supposed to be an alcoholic drink. So we're going to mix it with some curacao, a little bit of rum and then I finish it with some cherry bitters. Now for this particular event, they asked us not to do additive. So I was like, ah, I was gonna do something like that again. Now the coffee we were using then, very floral, very light, very very aromatic. This one is different. This is a lot more milky, a little bit more body, sweet and creamy. So it's not quite the same, right? And so George is sipping on some Larcity Barrel Proof while I get ready to have an adventure. Oh, excellent. Yeah, so whatever you guys are smoking and drinking, let us know in the comments. Definitely want to know. And George George One is with us today. What's going on? And Brian's calling in. What's going on, Brian? Brian is out there in Phoenix, Arizona. So he's how's the weather out there in Phoenix? Everything good? 
Is it hot? 105? Maybe less. I don't know. I don't know. What let, let us know what you're smoking, everybody. You know, mom, I guess you're just going to, you're just contemplating smoking maybe <laughs> or smoking after. Anyway, so they're different coffees, but I wanted to see like, what if I added just a little bit, right? Just if I add a little something, you know, I don't really, personally speaking, I'm not too worried about winning. We're just like, well, let me add, maybe if we should add a little bit of something just to, you know, just to get a little bit of thing there. Back at work, enjoying it. El Re oh, yeah. Okay. Back at work, enjoying El Rey del Mundo. Oh, nice. Nice. El Rey del Mundo Havana. And Brian says it's a hot 104 in the shade. Oh, my gosh, man. Crazy, crazy. In things with us, what's going on, man? How are you doing today? Welcome to the show. Always good to have you. So I've got this coffee, and I thought we'd give it a try. So I, I co-brewed it just the other day. Um, if you tuned in, if you, I've been doing this almost daily live stream in the morning on the main channel, the Ono Coffee channel, right? Uh, about coffee Q and A, practical brewing, things like that. And so I brewed this the other day, and I was, you know, trying it out there. So I thought I'd share with it a little bit here. So let's take this. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take this. Oh, and what this is? This is actually, it's not technically. Well, I guess technically it's a toddy. It, it, I didn't use a toddy container, so. This is the toddy container, and this is actually the toddy bottom for it, right? And this actually, actually, Brian gave this to me 20 years ago. And this is like the home toddy. So you make a gallon of coffee in here. And what you do is you you take this big vessel, right? It's, got, it's this big vessel. Oh, I have, a, I have an overhead camera. Let me just turn that on. Ah. Everything's all crazy. All right, so we've got this, this thing here. You can see. So here is this little bottom, and then there's this, this hole. So this, you take a stopper, this rubber stopper. You put it in there, right? And you take this fuzzy, foamy, not foamy, but more like um, feltish filter, and you put it down in this bottom, all right? You add your coffee, and for one gallon of this of this brewing thing, of this vessel, you're going to put one pound of coffee. Add water, and then let it steep overnight, 12 hours, 16 hours, however long. I didn't use this. I just took a regular, like, Cambro container from the kitchen, filled it a half-gallon Cambro, half, ga half pound of, of cold brew, coarse, coarse ground, and then a half gallon of water to fill it up, and then waited, like, 12, 16, I think it was 16 hours. And then I actually put it in this thing to use the filtration, you know, on it. So put that in, put that on top of the vessel, pull the thing out, and it just flows through. And, and actually, this really works well. Like, if you were to use, like, paper filters that you would in a conical filter, it gets clogged. This doesn't really get clogged. This really works really well. Really, really I'm surprised. All right, so that's what we did. And so that's how we got here. This has been refrigerated for the last, you know, couple, day or so. So we're going to brew this and pour this out. I'm just going to pour a little bit out. And, oh, that's the other thing. This is a concentrated form. So really, you're supposed to cut it down one-to-one. -one. Uh, yeah, that's good. Yeah, it's good. Oh, that's so nice. Gosh. Sweet, milky, creamy, nice body, medium bodied, like really just beautiful flavor. This, the reason that I use this coffee for cold brew. Oh, we've never seen. Yes, yes this is one of those times that I finally pull something unique and new to use on the show. <laughs> oh, what's going on there, Tony? Welcome to the show, man. Good to see you. And uh, Steve is listening while driving home from work. What's going on, Steve? Be careful. Then we're heading to the lounge to finish the show. Awesome. 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 Should be using a chill glass. I guess I could, but you know, everything's chilled, so it's all right. It's all right. Yeah, it looks, it always looks a little bit lighter on camera. Actually, it looks pretty dark from my side, but anyway, so it's it's still very nicely flavored. And why I chose this is that this is what we call an 
anaerobic process coffee. And what that means is that you're taking the coffee after it's been pulped and you're going to ferment the mucilage off of the bean, off of the, yeah, the bean. We take the, the, the producer takes it and puts it in rubber bladders. And it's called anaerobic fermentation, but I don't think that this kind of thing really works in true anaerobic environments, like a true vacuum environments or lack of oxygen, but it's low oxygen really. And that really gives, uh, it, it really encourages malolactic fermentation. So the malic acids convert to lactic acids, which give this really, it's milky sweet character. Now you can take this to real hard extremes and get blue cheese funkiness out of it, which is kind of interesting. Or you can be a little bit more conservative and get something like this. And so when I first tried this in like 2014, 2015, somewhere around there, my dear friend Elian Mirish, she unfortunately passed away like in June. But she was the one that was like, hey, I got this coffee here. I want you to try it. Why don't you give me your feedback? And I was like, oh, my gosh, man, this is just amazing stuff. And so we've been using this at Spro for since that time, since at least 2015, to make our cold brew and it's just been beautiful beautiful i think it's some of the best cold brew ever now what i want to know wow that's really maybe it's it's helped by sitting down for a couple for a day or two now the question that i'm you know looking into let me just adjust this if i was to add cherry bitters I got the Fee Brothers cherry bitters here, right? If I was to add that, would that help? Or, or not necessarily help, but would it give a different level of complexity? Oh, I guess, do I need this? I guess so. Would this give a different level of complexity that might be more enjoyable? I tried it with regular bitters, the regular, the other Fee Brothers at the original bitters, and that was not, that did not add anything to it. So we've got our cherry bitters, and what we're going to do is we're going to take the cherry bitter. We're going to just do a little bit of a dash. There we go. One drop, and I drop one on down here before it burns through my leather. Does that add anything? Not so much on the aromatics on the nose, not so much. Maybe there's another dash. There, there is a little bit more of a, it's killed with a little bit of that sweetness. There's another drop added. George says, you gave me some of those beans. I made a cobra, cobra with them, but I barely touched the result elixir with a, with a drop or two of agua. Ah, yeah, well, I mean, you can certainly make it more potent. But, you know, it's really, we really create the ratios to be at this kind of mixture. I think if you put some sugar in it, it might be a little bit more poppy. I don't know. I don't know. Okay, that. I don't think we're going to go in that direction. Maybe if we were using like some of like the, the curacao and something like that. But of course, also this is a total. It's not a floral. It's not a floral coffee. So I don't know. Maybe we'll think. I'll think more about it. Time to think more about it for that. Are you pandering to adults who buy their daily fix from a gang of per? -per <laughs> I could, but I mean, they did ask me not to do something to it, so maybe I shouldn't. And honestly, this, this coffee as a cold brew stands up on its own. Like, there's no real need for anything else. Tony says, drop a couple amaranth cherries in there. I was thinking about that. The problem is that, you know, then it becomes sweeter. And I just wanted to have this, like, I was thinking about how do we pull out a little bit of a twang out of it? Well, whatever. I can just go this way. This is probably the best way to go. I'm going to make a little bit more. Whoops. All right, that's good. 
Yeah, just leave it alone. All right, so that's our drink for today. Oh, see, so much better. Maybe a little bit more water. Now I'm chasing that original taste. Maybe there's more of that uh, bitters left behind. Anyway, let's move on to our cigar of the day. So let's get our humidor out. Courtesy of Rusty. Look at that. Beautiful. Zoom in some here. There we are. You can see the humidor's here. Open it up. Now let's do our little check here. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. You know, look at this thing. What year did we get this again? 2020? 2021? 2021? This thing. Now, it's a little bit hard here in the corners. Right, it's feeling a little bit sandy, but look at this thing! Like, I mean, that's that's some serious like humidity holding. All right, so our cigar today is something called the Telephone Booth by. By a cigar company called J. London out of Philadelphia. So I was, a couple weeks ago, I went to go see Oppenheimer, right? At the IMAX theater. And the only place selling, or only place screening IMAX in its original or in its true 1570 format is up in King of Prussia. And so I drove up to King of Prussia to go see this movie I, I, because I wanted to experience the picture, right? And so I went up there, and I, on the way after the movie, I stopped by a, a place called Cigar Mojo. And they moved there from the, the, from the last time I was there, like five years ago. They moved to a new location, nicer place, bigger space. And this is one of the cigars that they had on display. This is... By a guy named, um, what is his name? Let me look it up here. A guy named John Fiont. He's a regular, I believe, at the Mojo. And he started his own cigar company. He's got some of the lines, this gold series that has like Connecticut um, wrappers on it. These are part of his telephone booth series. So I guess it's kind of all London themed because these are like London phone booths, right? What I would like to call TARDIS. Actually, I prefer to call it TARDIS. You should just call it, you know, TARDIS. I know TARDIS is the police box, not the phone booth. I know, I know, I know. But I just like that better. Oh, George says it was still holding up. It was 2021 up in Ridgewood. Yes, exactly. And I feel just like the typical instrument at the bar. Too much. <laughs> And we'll get a little bit more about IMAX. Oh, yes, Mojo opened a second store. I believe the second store opened right before I came up to Philadelphia. So I did not go to the new store. I only knew about that one, and I only went only went to that one. And Tony says he's smoking a 10-year-old studio tobacco, Kane FF Lancera, and a dietary Pepsi. Excellent, excellent, excellent. I guess the J. London. And so this is... um. There, this is this is something they, they came out with, I think, at the end of 2022. Right, let me look here. They have a they have three of them. Let me show you the they have three lines the pink, green, uh, this, this pink one, pink, green blue that doesn't look so blue does it it looks kind of black um yeah and then what is it this is from half wheel uh so you can see there's let's go to so this is the guy jonathan who owns j london and let me find the let's go to his web page and so on his web page as you can see he's got this four colors blue green pink and this orange 
There's only blue, green, and pink as far as I've been able to, to, to tell. And I believe it was blue, green, and pink in that order because this is a series three. And I don't know why there's a, an orange or, or if an orange is going to come out. But it does. Here, as you can see here, it talks about these are short run, limited production cigars made by a family of four generations of experience in growing processing tobacco. What I didn't understand when reading this was like, you, you talk about this family of four generations. Why not? Tell us who they are. Like, what? what's with the coyness? You know, I, I don't understand. Like, the family hired a master blender with 40, over 40 years of experience in the industry, blend this on the factory in the world. Okay, that's cool, but I don't know. I don't know. So it started in December 2022, and every four to six weeks after they released subsequent ones. And so evidently, as you can see here, the, the tobacco used in this is four to six years old and was stored away for this occasion. I don't know what that means. It sounds a bit, that sounds a bit markety. This year's design showcased what's possible when the master blender gets his hand on the aged tobacco and we're lucky the ones to bring it to you. Like, I don't know. I'm, I'm just wondering like if you're really like a small new brand, would you really be able to have that kind of pool? Maybe, maybe, I don't know. I don't know. So the first one was this um, Corojo wrapper. And then, so this had the, and then Allure, Binder, Broadleaf, Criollo 98 filler. And then there was the green that had a San, San Andreas wrapper. And then they, from, went from, they still had the Allure, now Lijero, Binder, and then Dominican, assorted Dominican fillers. Now we're here to the third one. This is a Habana Maduro, Allure Viso Binder, Dominican, you know, fillers, and came out in March of 2022. These are still in stock at... Um, what do you call it at uh, at Cigar Mojo just a couple weeks ago? So and I and I think they had quite a bit. So hopefully it'll be worth buying, and you want to go get some. So this is a four and a half by fifty four Petit Robusto. And George says, "Tony, those Cane FFs were badass, but how did you manage to hold on to it for so long?" And also that it's impossible his contracts forbids him from naming the factory. I guess I guess that's true. I guess that's true. And then to answer your question, no. No, oh, now I can't remember the question. <laughs> a little bit itchy there. Okay, so let's get into it. And um, it looks really nice. The wrapper looks really nice. I do dig the little, like, telephone boot sticker. Like, I kind of, you know, it's just a little sticker, right, on here. Like, look at that. It's just a little sticker. Like, I kind of wish they would give away some of these stickers so I could stick them on places, you know. It'd be kind of fun to stick little telephone booths everywhere. All right, so the the MSRP according to Half Wheel is fourteen dollars and sixty cents. No, that's not right. Is that right? Oh yeah, I guess so. Fourteen dollars sixty cents per cigar. Total run of three thousand cigars, and um, yeah, let's give it a try. We're gonna open it up. Maybe I'll take that telephone booth off and see if it works. Now, it whoop, over here, okay. Like it has a really nice feeling, right? It it looks it's it's a little bit bumpy. It's a little bit in a kind of like it's not when you rub your fingers over it. It's not smooth. Like it's a, you can feel the veins. Like I can feel this vein here. I can feel this vein here. It, it's a little bit bumpy but gosh it really looks pretty this reminds me of pull-up leather like this like this leather boom right got that got similar characteristics like pull-up leather you can kind of like get a different color look at that like that right it kind of has that kind of aura to it it seems to me but and it looks like it feels veiny and bumpy but it looks nice it's like a pretty color sheeny and it has a little bit of a satin sheen like it's nice like the oils are good, like it feels nice, a little bit silky, bumpy, but silky, you know, so not bad. Top knot, let me get a little bit more exposure.
Here's the top knot. Should we zoom in a little bit more? Let me zoom in a little. There we go. How about that? There it is. Nice little top knot there. Kind of, I guess that's what we call what we call pigtailish, right? <coughs> yeah, darker shade of tobacco. Definitely a darker shade. Like it, it looks nice. I think it looks nice. The shade of the color of the tobacco. Now there's a little bit of manure esque, but you know, some cigars have a really bold fragrance to them. This one I would not say is so bold. Like I really have to sniff and sniff it, sniff the the the, uh, the, the fragrance out of it. But it's like a light manure, fairly pleasant, fairly pleasant overall. Nothing to be nothing to turn you off, you know. Oh, we should do some measuring. Well, that's a bit bright. All right, our grading form, we're going to take that. We're going to make our marks. I'm going to make that first mark there. Pretty much that entire space, the cigar grading form. Let's have a look. So 11 and a half centimeters. So what's that about here? Eight, maybe there. Yeah, that's probably good. Okay, good. There it is. We got our it's a hogtail. Ah, hogtail. Excellent, excellent. Three years later. <laughs> All right, so let us get our oh, we're gonna cut. We're gonna cut. Of course, Zycar MTX cutter. Yeah, nice. There we are. A little hog tail is there. It is. Maybe I should keep that. Put that on my desk. <laughs> a little bit of flaking off here. Look at this. There's a little bit of flaking off here from the end. I don't know what that's all about. Maybe just a little bit of shortcutting, but. Yes, that car's good. All right, let's see. How about our draw? I got. I did get a pretty wide cut on that, right? Look at that. I got a pretty wide cut. Do keep it. The Zycar? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Oh, you mean the... Uh, the, the ca All right, I'll, I'll stick it on my computer. Now, you know, if this is Petit Robusto, it's got a pretty thick. Like, this is pretty thick. It says what here? It says that this is a 54. I don't know what size this is. Let's see. I mean, it's two millimeters, two centimeters. If that's 54, then okay. I don't, it just feels, it feels substantially girthy. The pigtail, I want to see if it's actually a second piece of tobacco. I'm not sure. I mean, I, I guess so. It looks like it is. I mean, look at the way that it was cut. I mean, it's pretty. Oh, it's a behike size knockoff. All right, all right. I mean, I I'm not, 
I actually am, I find, I think that's kind of pleasing. Big, oh, cold draw, a little bit of sweetness. Cold draw is nice and tight. It's tight. I like that. I mean, not too tight, but just a good snugness in the draw. A little bit of spiciness on the tongue. And a sweet... There's a, a hint of jackfruit for me. And Inting says, pretty much bahiki size. Oh, yeah, you're right. Exactly. Exactly. Everybody's in agreement here today. I do like the Bahiki 54s. Well, I've only had it once. That was really great. I had another time. It was not so great. All right. So time to like. i got to push the fan off of me for a moment because it just blows out the... Uh, Oh, here you are, George. Matches from Capital Cigar. I do like the blue heads. Like they put on Capital Cigars matches, they put a blue head. Whoa. I like that blue head. Very nice. How about we do this? Oh, that did not do enough. It still is not fully lit. All right, there we go, there we go. Here's an interesting thing. Look at this. Blue, when we lit it, blue before we lit it, and now that it's out, it's still, look at that, it's still blue. The head is still blue. That's kind of strange. What's up with that, George? What kind of hocus-pocus magic is that there? Oh, there's a lot of like, a lot of flavor, a lot of like forward flavor notes, pepper, spice. Not what you would think from like a Dominican cigar. Like this is actually a bit assertive. There's a little bit of a strange burn happening here. That little peak. We're going to have to watch that. It's a little bit uneven, but it's a little bit uneven here. But of course, what can you expect? It was not fully, I didn't get to, I, I was unable to light it fully in one go. Dark secret from the Capitol Labs. <laughs> it feels like a substantial smoke. There's definitely some strength behind it. It is a lot of pepper. No, it's a question of like how pleasant is it? And right now it's a little bit when the acrid, a little bit harshness. Exactly 31 minutes on the starter to go cigar lighting. I'm going 
<laughs> you should. You should. I think we normally. I actually. I think we. No, I normally target at least twenty minutes or so before we get to the cigar, because sometimes the cigars only last like an hour and a half, and like. I would like the show overall to run till at least around 10. Otherwise, what is Steve going to do? You know, he's got to, he's got to catch up, you know. And, and, and Brian tells me that when, when we end the show, on those times we've ended the show, like around 930 or so, like Steve will call and be like, oh man, what am I going to do now? It's like, oh man, I'm sorry about that, dude. <laughs> if it were the Deep Creek Lake episode, the show would have ended five minutes. We only lasted, we lasted 30 minutes back then. Man, I'm impressed. Man, that was brutally cold, brutally cold. I really thought that a 110 degree or 120 degree hot tub, I could sustain the show the whole time. Like I was really prepared to sustain the show the entire two hours. But man, when you we took that cover off of the hot tub, it must have been like it was like negative fifteen or something like that, man. The, the heat energy just billowed out of that thing. It was so like it was brutal. That was that was brutal. Actually, it was kind of scary because like you know because it it was so cold. I guess in those few weeks that there was a sheet of ice that had formed on the around around the hot tub. And actually, one of my friends she she actually slipped and hit her head really bad. Like she had a concussion. They took her to the hospital. It was terrible. George says, next week, there'll be no problem lasting till 10. That's right. That's right. Next week, we're going to be having, the schedule is, is going to be having the 20th anniversary of my father's, courtesy of George. So be sure to tune in. We're going to talk about that. This is, there's enough of a resistance in the draw that really kind of, I feel like it, it makes you want to take your time. Like it, it, it's not like one of these free flowing cigars that you just want to, you just want to suck down. Right. This one, it has a little more resistance. So you want to just take your time. It, it, or it forces you to take your time. But there is a little bit of like, harshness on the tongue like like there's something slightly unrefined about the cigar and it's been consistent throughout since the light I'm hoping there'll be some change as we go along because while there's some spice and some pepper and there's some good body, I can I already feel like if, if it continues this way in a static manner throughout the cigar, I'll be kind of bored. <clears throat> It'll be kind of, you know, yeah, you, like you it won't hold your attention as long. Let's see how it goes with the cold brew. So how's everyone's week been? Everything been good or anything happening to think of? George says he's starting to think about a backup cigar for tonight. Oh, what do you have available? Or if, if you're in Bethesda, you've got plenty available to you. I have to say, when we were down for the, the anniversary party, it has been a long time since I've had the Flor de las Antilles. And I remember smoking it a couple times in the past. And I, I remember it, it was never negative. But I must say, I, I really enjoyed that one that I had there. I think I enjoyed it more than other times. Surprising. It was surprising. 
Oh, oh, I need to think about a backup. For tonight? Oh, you mean to get rid of this? Oh, no, no. We're going to go through the whole thing. We're going to go through the whole thing. That's what we're about. We want to go through the whole thing. Give it a fair shot, right? Like, let's just say, not, not that this is happening now, but let's say we had a cigar that was just, oh, like the one that Brian gave me, that Camacho Blue Label. My God, man, that was... I haven't put down a cigar because I couldn't handle it anymore in a very long time. Actually, almost never have I done that. Once. I had this truly, like, harsh dog rocket of a cigar when I was in Veracruz, Mexico, right? I was in Veracruz for a coffee trip, and we, were, we went, and there was this dude who was selling cigars out of a little box on the, you know, in, on the street. And I was like, you know what? Let me try that because, you know, it's, I'm in Mexico. I'm going to try it. Man, that thing, talk about manure flavor, like not pleasant, sweet manure, but just like, like that was, that's really one of the only times I ever put down a cigar. Like I was like, oh, I can't, I can't do any more of this. Even, even the night in, in, uh, in New Orleans, when I had the Gurkha 12 year vintage, that was just detestable. I did not put that down. Now, it could be that I didn't put it down because the person who gave it to me, I wanted to, you know, honor his his generosity. And it was only the only cigar that I had. So, I, you know, if I put it down, then I would have nothing. But, man, that Camacho, like, holy moly, that was really, really bad, really. And George says, exhausting. I can't type, obviously. New student orientation tomorrow for almost, oh, my gosh. Last year at six hundred. So, does that mean like your 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 school your your school population is increasing, be well beyond the capacity of the physical capacity of the school itself? That just sounds exactly. Oh, you mean, you mean me? Yeah. Well, you know, we want to have. We want to give. So let's say let's say this cigar let's say this cigar was really rough. Maybe it'll improve somewhere along the way, right? You know, maybe in a in a in a personal smoking environment when I'm not doing this, maybe I'll put it down. But like in in this situation, we want to try to give every possibility. Yeah, definitely good luck on that. Definitely good luck. And I'm not saying this is bad, like by no means. But there's definitely elements that have, that were happening that I would that if it, if it continued, perhaps I wouldn't it wouldn't hold my like fascination as much and we've had those cigars on the show where it got a bit boring perked up a little bit towards the end it's just how it goes just how it goes it, it hasn't you know i don't think that i'm smoking on it too hard but i'm also we're not getting it's not really evening out i mean i'll slow down a little bit again and try not to puff on it but this is a Maybe I'll hold it this way. Tony once said that try holding it this way so the 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 unburned part is at the top. It'll help to. All right, forget the cigar. Tell us about Oppenheimer and oh. Oh wait, hold on. Let's do this first. We increased by 500 students. We have a brand new school. Oh, that's kind of nice and interesting. They changed the boundaries around the school. What does that mean? Does that mean they increase the boundaries or reduce the boundaries? And how does that impact student operations? And George Two says, forget the cigar. Tell us about the Oppenheimer IMAX. I mean, okay, so... You guys are familiar with all of this resolution talk in, in film and in video, right? Television now is in 1080p. The next thing is 4K. There's 6K. There's 8K. 8K is like the most. The 15, so in the world of IMAX film, they are 70 millimeters wide, right? 70, mil, 70 millimeters, which is... which is seven centimeters, 
right? They are th is this wide. The film frame is this wide, or the film itself is this wide, oriented vertically. And there's perforations on the film, if you remember. IMAX, true IMAX, is 15 perforations by the 70 millimeters. And it's horizontally um, indicated. So the actual frame, uh, or the actual frame of the film, is about that big, more or less. Which means it's, it is the most resolution of any film or video source in the world. Well, there's a new camera that just came out that's $200,000 starting that will rival the, the resolution of the IMAX, or I think it even surpasses it. But anyway, um, it's equivalent to what they say. They say it's equivalent to 18K, which is just insane. But when you, when you, when you frame with it, it's got such a big frame that those people that shoot in IMAX, when they transfer it down to digital, it crops to some level, right? Even the digital IMAX, like the IMAX theaters are all around here, White Owings Mills, White Marsh, or whatever. Those are all cropped laser, or they, they call it IMAX laser. So they're cropped digital pictures. So it's not the full true frame. And what's his name? Christopher Nolan has been using IMAX in portions of all of his movies for the last like 15 years. But this one, he shoots, I, th I think it's like over 80% has been shot in 1570. Get that. Oh, there's Die. What's going on, Die? How are you, man? Good to see you. Don't worry, James Cameron will make an avatar with a 200. <laughs> he probably will. That guy's crazy. That guy's crazy. But so in order for you to see this full frame, and, th and that full frame is the one you go to like the science centers and the Smithsonian, they have the true 1570, but I, they really don't show feature film. They just show, you know, the art films, the penguins, the space shuttle launching, thing, cool things like that. But this one is, is unique because it's, it's almost, you know, it's over 80% shot in IMAX. And so I was like, okay, that's worth going to check out. Now there's only 30 theaters in America that show 1570. The closest one is in King of Prussia. So I went up there to go see it. It was threatening to go out. And it was good. It was cool. In the first 10 minutes movie, some of it was soft. And I was like, well, how is it? So how is the focus soft? This is supposed to be the greatest format in the world. How is it soft? I don't know. I mean, Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer was good. Like, I'm not clamoring to see it again, right? Like, it was good. Like, you know, when you watch the previews, the trailers, like, they show all that, like, expansion of, like, the atoms and all this. And you're like, oh, man, that might be kind of cool if he really gets into that and, like, shows that on... It's only like maybe, I don't know, a few frames, 15, 20, you know, seconds of it. And that's it. You're like, that's it? That's it? That's like the most awesome part of it, right? Like, I thought they were going to exploit that in the, in the detonation of the, of the Trinity bomb, right? Now, the narrative overall is, is interesting. I think it was, it's a well-paced movie. There was a couple parts that was a bit slow that, you know, I thought you could have cut out. But overall, it was... Enjoyable. Is it worth making that crazy effort to go see it in IMAX? Now that I've seen it in IMAX, eh. you know, the IMAX, because it's only, it's so limited run and so many people want to see it, it's jam packed. So would I rather go see it in XD theater at Cinemark that's in regular, you know, 233 format with a, you know, three quarters empty theater? Yes, I'd rather go see it that way or wait till it comes out on video. 29, 29. When I go see Barbie and IMAX, well, it all depends on who is in the Barbie movie. And George says the third hour dragged. Yeah, I don't... <coughs> I don't remember. Actually, I got so tired of sitting in the seat. I, I happened to be the very back row. I, I got one of the handicapped 
companion seats. So I just stood up and like they had they actually had some like you know like loose chairs. So I grabbed one of those and sat like further a little like in behind my row and I was like, okay, that's more comfortable. And the theater was kind of warm. It wasn't a great experience. Popcorn and Coke and, and Pepsi were expensive. I think my popcorn and, and Pepsi was like eighteen dollars. Like the movie itself was like twenty five. I was like, ah. Oh. She was like starting to get out. Oh, son of a gun. That just ran off. Look at that. Is this what four to six year old tobacco does? It falls apart like that? Ah. Now, what movie of the past would be best in that format of IMAX? I mean, well, here's the thing. Like, there's no movies that have been made with this much IMAX. And, like, IMAX, if, you're, if you don't actually shoot it in IMAX, then it's not really worth watching in IMAX because the frame, the actual, like, dimension of the frame is different than anything. Else. Maybe 65 millimeter vertical, and I think that has, like, seven perf. That's similar in aspect ratio but not exact so you know what's what's worth what's worth it to see in in IMAX is the rocket launches that you see at the Smithsonian that's worth it maybe the penguins you know but that's the thing it's like unless you shot in IMAX it then it doesn't really matter all, all you're doing is making on a big screen <clears throat> like why is it different like you could of course you could crop out crop everything to whatever aspect ratio you want but you know, when you're shooting in IMAX, like you're kind of forced to use that that frame. And how does the director and cinematographer fill that original frame? That's the interesting. To me, that's the interesting part. Some of the uh, the last Bond movie, No Time to Die, was shot with IMAX. I don't know necessarily why they're doing that, but. And so, I don't know if you've ever seen this, but also the interesting about IMAX is massive cameras. And when I saw the, the No Time to Die behind the scenes video, you know, you would see them, and they actually, you know, shared the natural sound. And the, the cameras, like I've never worked with an IMAX myself, but the IMAX camera is so loud, it's clattering, like loudly, like you can't record... Without it, and that to me, that's the fascinating thing with Oppenheimer is the sound design, right? So I, I called up a buddy of mine. Um, no, I sent him an email, really. Alan Williams, who's the boom operator that that we know down in Atlanta, because you know he does videos about sound on YouTube. And I said, "Hey, man, what about doing sound? A video about how you know mixers and everyone handles everything that happens with IMAX." And so. He called up his buddy who did the who did the sound for Oppenheimer, and he was like, "It's so noisy! Like the the sound is, is the the live recorded sound is utterly useless because it's so noisy. So everything that they shoot on IMAX, they have to ADR it. And so you know when you when I when I thought I was watching the movie, I'm thinking about that. I was like, wow, man, that's really amazing that that they were able to do that. Like." The, the the dialogue replacement and the sound effects is, you know, it really shows off the art in that respect. George says, obviously, Empire Strikes, but Empire would be kind of cool. And John Ford Westerns. The only difference, the, the only thing in there is that you're taking, you're taking those movies, and I believe those movies, I don't know about the, the John one, the John Wayne one, but I think Empire was shot in 185 Academy, right? And so let me look up here. All right, so this, this is a, a little bit of an illustration of, of how it works, right? So here is 1570 IMAX. Like I told you, it's 70 millimeters this way, 15 perforations across. 
This is regular 35 five, uh, four perf, right? There's this is 185. Oh, this is probably 185 aspect in four perf. And then you have anamorphic like 233, which is three perf, right? So it would be this rather than this. So when you see those like letterbox movies, that's pretty much going to be anamorphic with three perforations. Now, here's the interesting thing. So this is the thing. If you shot, if you shot Empire like this, you would have to blow it up to this. And the amount of grain that would start to show at that kind of blow up, I think would be very noticeable. So that's the, that's the issue you face when working with, um, with blowing up. Now, if you started here with um, Super Panavision 70, and this is what they shot, um, movies like West Side Story was shot in this. So you, if you watch West Side Story, you see it kind of has that letterboxing. To get that letterboxing in 35, you have to use anamorphic lens, which actually squeeze the frame. The squeeze, they squeeze the image onto it. So it's kind of like they stretch it out, right? And they look elongated. So when you project it, you have to use an anamorphic, anamorphic lens on the projector that actually de-squeezes it and brings it out wide. Whereas Super 70, <coughs> it's, um, it's already this aspect. So... But shooting at 70 is, they say, is quite a bit more, or 70 millimeter film, either one, is quite a bit more than 35. So that's some of the issues that'll come up. George says, for the 200th episode party, we need to shoot the pot. <laughs> I would like that. I would like that. And George says, there was a 70 millimeter print of Empire. I think you're right. They would have blown it up to this, this kind of 70 millimeter instead of IMAX. But, you know, like if you go from, like I think if, I wish I could I wish I could drag and drop these around, but basically like this is maybe two and a half times. This is two and a half times the size of thirty five, where this is like I don't know six, seven, eight times the size. So the the blow up from thirty five to seventy is not terrible. You can totally do it, but to blow it up from thirty five to seventy IMAX would be. I, I think you would definitely see degradation of the image at that point. Yeah, like this is an image of the, the IMAX camera. So they're pretty, pretty large. And then there's some IMAX projectors. Evidently, Oppenheimer had a, Oppenheimer's runtime was limited by the size of these platters. Now they do have, I read somewhere they had some extensions on them. And so it's Oppenheimer's runtime is the maximum of the platters with the extensions. They could physically fit no more film onto the platters. Uh, what else do they have? Okay, so yeah, that's pretty much that's pretty much it there. I, ho I hope that gives you a better understanding of film and 35 and 70. <coughs> that would be a great idea to shoot IMAX. The problem is it would be so noisy. It'd be like, whoa, whoa, what? What are they saying? It would be awesome, though. I don't think we could afford it, though. Like, the, the rental of the IMAX cameras, because only IMAX has them, and only IMAX rents them out. And then the cost of the film. I don't. I mean, I don't really have an idea of like how much the film costs. I think you have to go directly to, to Kodak to get it. Hmm. Let's see... Okay, so here's something for you. So as a comparison, like if, if we're thinking about doing this for the show, right? So IMAX film, 1,000-foot one, 1, mag, right? So the magazines have 1,000 feet at 24 frames per second, which is the, the normal speed of 35 or motion picture film. 1,000 feet will run through the camera in three minutes. Holy crap. With 3D, you're looking at 2,000 exposed in three minutes. So now to give you a comparison, it, it, a thousand foot core mag in an IMAX camera is three minutes. A thousand foot core 35 millimeter film at 24 frames, like the type you see on normal Panavision cameras, like um, like here, this is the Panastar 2. 
I've worked with this camera. Oops. Like this is a thousand foot mag on it, right? Now this thousand foot mag will run for 10 minutes at 24 frames. So over three times the amount of, or three times less runtime and exponentially more film to be used. I mean, it would be a two hour show. How many quarters would we have to use for that? Let's see. 120 divided by three. So 40 cores. Hmm. Okay, so here it is. We're going to have to use it. So this, like it says here, some people mention the price is 15000 a week, a weekend for the IMAX. But the, the reality is that if you buy, if you're shooting a film, it'll cost you less per day because you're renting it out over three months. But 15000 a week end. It could be cheaper. But they also say that a roller, a thousand foot core, sixty-five millimeter Kodak film, which is smaller than the seventy, but let's say that is about a thousand dollars, just the cost of the film alone. So, we're talking over forty thousand dollars in film cost to do a two-hour filming of IMAX. We can add close cap. That's a good idea. I love it. I love it. Or hire Garrett Morris. Is he still around, Garrett Morris? Yeah, yeah, that's that's it. Then, yes, we absolutely can do that. We do have the technology available to us to do that and make that happen. Oh, Garrett Morse did die. Oh man, I did like Garrett Morse. Man, now you're really going back to some OG SNL people. Who did I watch? I just watched someone do their monologue recently. Oh, it was, um, what's her name? Um, I just saw it on YouTube recently. Um, Audrey Plaza. Audrey Plaza. I really like, I like her. I think she's cute. So how's this coming along? It's good not terribly complex it's just kind of one note looks nice i mean the thing is in the description there's lots of superlatives about this cigar Rusty does food. You, okay, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. I think someone's mentioned we should do something for the 160th episode. We could do that here. It'll be a little bit cooler by uh, September, October. Be a nice time because this is episode now 156. So in about a month. Yeah, let's do that. We can totally do that. Or maybe not a live stream, just a, a hangout. Especially on the weekend, weekend evenings here, there's nobody in the parking lot. We totally have the parking lot to ourselves. Set up the chairs, set up the screen, some speakers. Yeah, this is just not... Oh, yeah, we are at the, uh, we are here. We are finished the first, third. Okay, so it is a bit darker. Let me put that there. Fragrance of Cold Draw. 
good plus? You know, the body has been quite medium plus going towards heavy. I'd say it's very good, the body. Now, the flavor, though, has not been, you know, it's been good plus. I wish I could say it was better, but it's just been kind of, it's almost, it's threatened to go out a couple times, too, in the first third. And I mean, the cigar is in good condition, you know, humidity-wise. I mean, I got it from their humidor, put it in a bag, drove home, put it in the humidor here, and it's it feels very proper, properly hydrated, just not a lot of Tony, I plan the cigar menu. You pick the film or we can stream episodes. We don't need to stream episodes. We have them. No problem. If you want to see Mandalorian. Have you not seen? But I think everybody we know has seen Mandalorian. Or we could do Ahsoka, the new series. Like this, evidently two two drop this week. I haven't watched them yet. I haven't I have to go watch them at some point. Also, the new the new episode of Only Murders in the Building. I have not watched that yet either. A buddy of mine was like, "Hey, it's really good. You should go watch it. I'll, I'll watch it. I'll watch it." And I don't know if you if you, and I know you may I don't know how many of you have followed that lioness, but um, it took a very nice. It took a very nice turn at the at the end of the last episode. I was like, "Oh, <laughs> kind of like the scene in um, what's that movie with uh, Denise Richards and um, not Rob Lowe? They're in Miami. He's kind of a con artist, <clears throat> and um, the girl from Scream, the kiss." It kind of takes that kind of turn. You're like, whoa, I need to check that out. George says, Ahsoka's for children. Oh, oh, I don't know. I don't know. Tony says, I was whored by my other viewing location, so I've only seen the middle of the first season. Oh, Mandalorian? Oh, okay, we could do Mandalorian. Yes, wild things. Thank you, Tony. That's... <laughs> Uh, not Rob Lowe. What is that guy? What's the guy's name? The guy, what's his name? He puts it, he puts that in his pocket. I was like, that is just, I need to do that one day. <laughs> there you are, die. Matt Dillon and Nev Campbell. Yeah, there we are. There we are. Linus took long. Yeah, I think Linus was definitely slow the first two episodes. I think it's much better now. <clears throat> like the last, the previous episode to the, to this one, there was a good scene there, right? There was actually, they, they kicked the crap out of these people. It was really, actually, these last two episodes have been quite quite interesting. Because Nev was spectacular. Oh, yeah, she was, she was, she was. Yeah, it's a little bit flat, like... I want to be excited about it, especially since this guy that, that blended it was has 40 years of experience, and there's four generations of tobacco people with family behind it, and four to six years of aging. What's up, Rusty? Welcome to the show. How you doing, man? Having a cigar tonight? How was, uh, were you at the, oh, no, you weren't at the restaurant because school's about to start, so restaurant's over, right? So at home, I use a, uh, one of those Apple Magic trackpads, trackpads, right? I really like that. Here, for the last, since I sort of the last couple of years, I've been using this Mixmaster 3. And it's been good. But lately, this past six months, I feel like there's a little bit of pain here. And I'm wondering, like, how much of that has to do with this movement, especially for the editing. I'm doing, like, little swirls and, like, this kind of movement, so I'm not really. So I wonder if it's giving me pain. So in order to, act, you know, to try to lessen that, I bought this. 
I bought the new Magic Trackpad from Apple in black, so I paid a little bit more for it. Paid 20 bucks more than the white. <clears throat> but I'm not really enjoying it. Like, there's so many gestures and sensitivity to this thing that, like, it just frustrates me. Like, at times I'm, like, trying to move places, and it just does, like, whatever it wants. It, it, like, when I'm editing, it'll jack up the audio track, if I, the volume of the audio track. It'll move stuff around as I'm, it'll drag stuff around when I'm not intending to drag it. So, <clears throat> I mean, I'm chalking it up that I just need to use it more and get used to it, to the sensitivity. But it's sometimes just, I just kind of want to throw it out. Rusty starts schools Monday, but I will keep the restaurant job, but to reduce hours. Okay, that's gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Wild Things, yes, yes. I, I did enjoy that movie. I love that she was a sailor at the end. I love that. So here we are. We're burning again a little bit off. Like the burn is has, you know, gotten a little bit off. That's a little bit of an irritant. <coughs> oh, gosh. Let me share with you something that I've been working on this week. So, you know, I do a bit of traveling for, for coffee. And <coughs> my travels will usually take me out some, somewhere to Asia what, once a year or so. So when I'm out there, I try to make a trip on the way back to stop off in Tokyo for a few days. Well, when I was in, in, on this last trip, I, I, took a time, I, took, I planned the time to be there for a week. And, but typically when I go there, I'll fly in and out of Narita Airport. And at the airport, there's a big mall that you can shop in. Really nice. A lot of restaurants and shops. Really cool. And I, years ago, I came across this place called the Traveler's Company. They have a little shop there. And they make these little journals for traveling. They have all these little travel knickknacks and supplies. And they have little stickers. They're all really cute stuff. And I've always liked that store. And I've always checked it out. But I really use a big notebook like this side, this one, for most of my work, so my note-taking, so it houses all of my recipes and, like, projects for the last 15 or so years. <coughs> and, oh, George says, I'm going to go out on a limb and predict that tonight's cigar will not challenge me for rating super... Well, one will never know until we're at the end, right? It could be, it could be like... The 2012 Pittsburgh Steelers, right? Back then, we played the Steelers, and we're beating them. Last two minutes, and we're, like, up by quite a significant amount. And somebody will say, oh, man, we're going to win now. And they go, whoa, 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 whoa. You can't be saying that. You never know. If anybody's going to come back from a 42-point deficit and beat us, that's going to be the Steelers. You never know. This, I'm not saying this is Steelers. It is from the same state, but... Who knows? Who knows? Maybe. Who? <laughs> anyway, so they have the, so when I was in T Tokyo this year, I went to my, this one shop, this one department store that I go to called Tokyo Hands, and they had a little display of these travelers company notebooks, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to buy some. Let me give it a try and see what it's about. And so let me share with you their website. This is the Traveler's Company. And this is the little notebooks they make. So they have these little like leather. Whoops. They have these leather cases that you buy. And you put their notebooks on the inside and they use elastic to hold them in place and to close as a closure, right? This is the closure or that's not it. Or yeah, that's that's what it looks like closed. Now, you fill them with these little notebooks. So these little notebooks, I can see they're 550 or so, and they have, you know, grid type. There is um, blank ones. You know, there's a whole variety of inserts and stuff that you can buy to, to make your own notebook with, you know, 
diaries and monthly diaries, craft paper, all these things. And it's really kind of nice. But when I was buying my stuff or picking the stuff out in, in Tokyo, I think the inserts are actually like 350 in Tokyo, like 350 yen. And then the, the actual leather binders were like $35. Here in the United States at, at the website, on, on the website, as you can see, they are a little bit more. They are $55, which even the $35, I was like, oh, that's a bit much, you know, especially it's just a piece of leather that they punch a couple holes in to fit the elastic and put the elastic in. And I was like, I, I've got a bunch of leather here at the shop. So why am I going to spend the money like, and, and buy all of this when I can just buy like, what I did is I'm going to buy this repair kit, which gives me one, two, three, four, five different elastic colors. And I think it was 1300 yen or thousand yen, which is about $10. So I was like, I'll buy that. And um, that will give me, you know, something. And then I'll eventually I'll just build my own. And so I had some of that pull-up leather that I showed you earlier, and this is what I've come up with. This, whoops. I just used the elastic. I kind of did a little bit of a different style on it. And this one, I have three inserts in it. Now, as you can see, I haven't used them at all yet. Like I, I, I'm still trying to figure out how to use it. Like what am I, I'm probably gonna use it actually for when I travel, but what I have in here is cream colored blank lined. Oh, I guess you can't see any of that. It's all over, whether you can see it kind of here, lined and then the, uh, the gridded, oh man, so bright. Yeah, you can see the gridded now, right? So the gridded, the lined, and then I'm just using the elastic through here and uh, so I basically just took a hole punch, punch one, two, three, four, five holes in it. And then it just kind of wraps around like that. And there it is. And then I just stick my pen, my little fountain pen here on it. And uh, that's my project. So that was my project this week. Oh, I did a little bit of blue edge lining. So you can see it's kind of blue on the edges. My first time working with this, I'm actually working on a larger project for this using that Louis Vuitton canvas that I, I think I showed you guys that a couple weeks ago. Yeah, a little bit, trying to be a little bit crafty, you know. It's, it's, it's kind of interesting. I don't know if it's working as well as I would like it to, but you know, this is, so I figured I would do this first before going to the next, the, the Louis Vuitton canvas, figure out what I like about it, what I don't like about it, and then make the other one. So that's kind of what I've been doing this past week, just kind of playing around. Where's my cigar? Here it is. I, I got to tap that. I think it's going out. Hmm. You see the burn, it's just it's just off and the wrapper's no longer burning on that side, so will this lighter work? I gotta get more lighter fluid. Ooh. Okay. That sort of works. But now with that relight comes a little more heat, a little more acridity. 
We're still not at the end of the second third yet, though. Line the leather with the LB canvas. Yeah, my plan is actually, I'll show you what I'm what I'm kind of planning on at the moment. And part of the reason why I haven't done the LV one was because I'm having a little bit of difficulty finding the um, the leather that I want to use. So this is what I'm this is what I'm thinking about. We have the the Braza wallet. This one here. I think there's one. There it is. I really like this. I think this looks very nice. So this is what I would like to do. Get this kind of like yellow leather and then use it in this manner and then build these interior pockets. I think the pockets look. Why doesn't this want to move around? Yeah, so like kind of like this look. Something like that I think would be kind of dope. So that's kind of eventually what I like to do. The thing is that at the leather store, they did not have this yellow type of leather. They had no kind of yellow leather. This is that Italian leather called um, Ver Verchetti or something like that. So it's, it's got engraving in it or like distressing. It's very, this is actually very, I think this is very pretty. I'm not going to say, so you can kind of see there's this little lip here. There's a pocket here. I'm not going to put the pocket. I just want to put the card slots. Really keep it simple. And then it since it since these are pretty wide, you know, width wise, they'll fit a passport. So I was thinking about putting a passport pocket in it as well. Now, while dimension it looks as big as this thing, it's actually much smaller. It's really quite small. In real life, I went when I was up in a uh, when I was up in uh, what do you call it in Philadelphia, King of Prussia. I stopped by the LV store in King of Prussia to just to have a look at it to see, like for example, these type of pockets, right, are basically for credit cards, and they just basically hole punch, hole punch, and then cut a line and then stack them. But what they're doing, they're actually fabric lined, right? So there's little fabric pockets. For whatever the dimension of each slot. So you have to build that into it. So I'm, I wanted to have a look at it in person to at least get a feel for how I'm going to have to, you know, construct it and what kind of materials I need. And actually the, the general manager or the manager of the store was really friendly. He was the only guy that helped me and he was just showing me around and they're very welcome. I was really surprised. They're super welcoming now. And it's super like, like in the old days, Louis Vuitton stores were quite stodgy, right, and stiff. Nowadays, they're kind of hip and happening and, and light and airy and friendly and welcoming. It's like, hmm, is this Louis Vuitton? George says he's got a bounce. Sorry, man. Good to see you there. Thank you for tuning in. My prediction with the cigar score is 77.5. All right, let's see. Let's see. We will find out later. May not be too far off. Let's see, how are we still? We still got a ways to go for the second, third. All right, see you next week. Good to see you. Have a great one. So what's been going on in your world? As, uh, as I'm sure all of you know, they had the big uh, Republican uh, debate yesterday. Well, I don't know if it's not primary debate. It's like a bunch of hopefuls. 
Um, it seems that people have uh, seem to agree that the loser was, uh, was DeSantis. I don't, I don't know. I didn't watch. I didn't bother to watch that. But Trump was not there. I was surprised. And Trump was today. They before I came on, they were doing the live streaming of um, of him checking into Fulton County, Georgia, where he was being booked and photographed. They did not share the photograph yet. I'm sure that somebody will at some point. But I was wondering, you know, like, like, like he's like the other day he was Trump was joking about, you know, Russia. Like he's good friends with Russia with Putin and. He would have a night. He could go there and have a nice life or something like that. And I was like, you know what? <clears throat> Here's a guy that has his own 757. He travels with relatively few people, you know, for for 757. <clears throat> he could easily jump on a plane and abscond to any of these countries that do not have extradition treaties with the United States, like Russia. And I imagine he could live a fairly nice life there. And I was. You know, I was kind of joking about that, but the other day with some friends, and I was like, but then I was thinking today when I was watching the video, he's got all this secret service, right, because he's a former president. <coughs> so one day, if he boarded the plane, and they were going to go somewhere, and he just had them peel off to Cuba or to Russia or something like that, like, what would they do? Would they chase after, like, would they send the military to go after him? as the plane violated whatever flight plan they had and was heading off to who knows where. And then what about the secret service? What would they do? Would they, so let's say he absconded to another place. Would the secret service still have to protect him while he was on the lam? I was thinking about that today. I was like, I wonder if that's gonna, I wonder if that's gonna be that way. Rusty says, I'm ashamed to say Christy is from my state. Oh, yes, he is. Didn't he get pinched for some kind of like billion dollar deal with the uh, George Washington Bridge? But that's what I was wondering. Like, if Trump were to go on the lam, would the Secret Service go with him? Would they protect him? Like, like for example, if you if like when Bush was president, right? His his daughters, they had Secret Service details, and they would smoke marijuana or do whatever. And the Secret Service isn't there to enforce federal law like that, right? They're there to protect the family and the president. So they would just they would do whatever they could they would do whatever they want to do and they wouldn't do anything and they would just make sure they didn't get killed or kidnapped or whatever. But if he absconds, what do they do then? Like if they continue like let's say he absconded off to Moscow, right? Putin set him up and with a house and whatever. Does that mean that Secret Service would then operate a protective detail to the to Trump in Russia or whatever non extradition treaty company uh, country that he would be in? I wonder. I wonder. That's what I wonder. Bridgegate. Ah, yeah, Bridgegate. So was he removed from office for that, or what? What? I don't really know what ever happened to him over that. As you can see that as a, as a fan that's blowing this way, right? You can see the, the smoke flying away from me. But I still get the smoke in the nose. And I'm just wondering, like, is that better? I'm, I just adjusted it to go kind of over the head. So maybe that'll be nicer. But it's a bit warm. Like, in, in here, it's warm. Like, while it's cool outside, the building itself is still warm. So I'm still like... Brian says he's not going anywhere, but he could. That's the thing. It's like, like, I don't know, man, if I was facing multiple indictments, I, there's a part of me that'd be like, well, I should just escape. I could escape. I just need to get to Vladimir's place. It'd be fine. Like if he took off, like if the, if the, if the 757 peeled away, would they shoot him down? <laughs> Oh, speaking of shooting him down, how about that guy Progosny? Everyone's the, the DOD. I saw I saw a report here that said DOD says that there is no evidence that the plane was shot down by a missile. And I was like, what? Of course he was shot down. The guy raised arms against Putin. 
Like, he doesn't really have a choice but to kill him. Ah, there, Steven. What's going on, man? Good to see you. How you doing? Did you guys get together? Did you guys already move to the cigar location? And where are you guys at? Ambassador? I, I'm saying that like I know. I don't really know. I've never... I really haven't been to Phoenix. I still need to get out there. I'd like to come visit Phoenix, see you guys, and then check out Pizza Bianco, go down to Tucson and visit Hoon, and then head down to Ajo to go visit another friend of mine. I hear Ajo's kind of far, though. Maybe not shot down, but taken out. Well, but I mean, they, they had to shoot. They had to do something to the plane. I don't know. Whatever, whatever. Okay, are we there yet? We are there. We are there. There we are, uh, more or less. I mean, I don't think it's improved. I think the body has remained the same. So seven and eight, seven and eight. As I may have said to you guys before, I've been doing a bit more shooting lately the uh, of the sporting clays type. So while Brian's been away, we went out uh, shooting. Buddy and I went out shooting today. We took the five stand. And uh, actually, Raul from Tobacco Leaf called me up. He's like, hey, man, I want to come along. He's like, come on out. We're going to show you how to shoot. His first outing did pretty well. My outing was okay. 12 out of 25 the first round. And then plummeting down to eight out of 25 in the second round. I was like, oh, gosh. Bud tells me it's going to rain tomorrow, so there may not be shooting tomorrow. I was like, ah, what? That's not, that's not good. And then I'm super busy on Saturday and then probably a little bit busy on Sunday. So I may have to wait till next week. Ryan, when are you coming back? Saturday? Is that right? Yeah, see, now that the fan is off of me, I can feel the heat of the room just kind of making my brow perspire. I'll be taken out, yes. So originally, George was going to come on today's show instead of next week because I was supposed to leave on Saturday to fly down to Quito, Ecuador to do their coffee competitions. Unfortunately, you may have heard a couple weeks ago, um, they had election. They were having, they're having elections last Sunday. I don't know what happened, but anyway, they were having elections and the front runner of the elections was assassinated in the middle of the streets in front of his uncle, gunned him down like a hail of bullets. And so the government decided to create a moratorium on all events or across the country for 60 days. So my event has now been, it looks like we're now pushing it back to January. So I'm no longer leaving on Saturday. I'll be here. That's why we got next. So that's why I called, I called George and said, hey, man, because he really wanted to have a closer Labor Day. So we're going to do that Labor Day. So we put a schedule for next week. So if you also look down at the in the show notes, you'll see the lineup of the cigars um, until October 5th. And I want to know if I'm around to me. Unfortunately, I'm not available on Saturday. Like I said earlier in the show, before you came on, Sarah, my former manager who started her own coffee company, she's having a fifth anniversary party. <coughs> and I've agreed to help them out with some with a with a coffee competition and um, judging a latte art throwdown. So unfortunately, I'm booked the entire day. I gotta turn this back down. It's too hot. The Healy car show would be kind of cool. I would like to see that. But unfortunately, I'm just not available for that. Sorry. A bit rough, a bit harsh. <sighs> Wish I could say it was better.
What else happening in the world? But you know, speaking of Trump, I must say one of the interesting things he's he never he never changes form. Like no matter what's happening, no matter what may be stacked up against him or what the judge may tell him, he's still out there on the offensive. It's like wow, that's kind of impressive. There's another part of it's like it's kind of impressive. Like most people, they're shamed. They're like embarrassed. This guy's like, nope. I am being wrongly accused. <laughs> Evidently, there was a mass shooting in Orange County. Some ex-cop was separated from his wife and went to this bar that he frequents, that where everybody knows who he is, goes in, shoots his wife at the... His wife is having dinner with a friend of hers, Shoots his wife, guns down his uh, her friend, this other woman. Shoots a couple more people in the bar. Goes outside. One of the patrons comes out after him to like I don't know to talk to him. Guns him down as well. And then like he gets into a gunfight with the local police. Hail of like seventy five bullets. He gets killed. It's like man, people are crazy. What's going on there? What else is going on here? I wonder if you heard about this blindside thing. I heard about it because of Sandy Bullock, right? It's like a lot of people are getting on with Sandra Bullock's case because she portrayed Michael Orr's mom in that movie, The Blind Side. And evidently, I wasn't sure what was going on. And so I looked it up. And then Michael Orr was like saying that they never truly adopted him, according to the paperwork. And they made the deal with the movie to get all the money of the movie without giving him any. And it's like, wait a minute, that's. This, the movie about his story. And I was like, what? That's that's crazy. And I saw another blurb today that said that the studio was, or the production company that made the movie was defending the the parents. I was like, what? Really? You need to shut up about that. I mean, like, it's one thing if it's their story, but it's his story. And I thought the movie was really good. Like, but oh well. Yeah, the cigar is not great, unfortunately. Not great. Man, it is pretty warm. Pretty warm. So anyway, what do you, what do you guys have going on the weekend? Now you know what I'm doing for the weekend. What do you guys going on besides besides die that's heading up to uh, Hershey? So I'm going to see a concert next month. I think September 13th. I don't know why I said yes to this, but like my cousin, his wife called me and she's like, hey, my friend that was coming with us to Duran Duran can't go. Would you like their ticket? I was like, well, how much is it? $177. I was like, oh, you know what? It'd be nice to hang out with you guys. So I said yes. But then I was thinking about like $177 to go to the Duran Duran concert. As much as I'm a Duran Duran fan over the years, one thing I find by going to like concerts of bands that we liked when we were teens is that you go to them and everybody's old it was like i don't know if i want to be with all these old people <laughs> like when you've been to k-pop concerts with all these young people you're like all right this is kind of cool but then and you're the old guy at the club right you're the old guy at the club but then when you're not the old guy at the club and everybody's old at the club i don't know if that's quite uh, i said yes so i, I guess i'll go I still remember the days when we went to concerts it was like twenty five dollars, thirty bucks. I like those days better. So, how's your guys' cigars doing? Anything 
really great. You're just okay. What you wanted, what you didn't want. Yeah, really, at this point, I'm kind of smoking it just to get through it. It's like, okay, we want to finish it out. And Dai says, I work with young people that haven't seen The Matrix because they think they know the story. So I'm curious, what, do they, what story do they think it is? Tony says that his cigar was spectacular. Oh, nice, nice, nice. Oh, the 10-year-old studio tobacco cane FF Lancero. Oh, nice, nice. I had, oh, Rusty, I had that cigar you gave to me, the one from the, the SP-14 or something like that. The one from that guy in New Jersey, that Lancero. Spicy, good body. Nice cigar overall, nice cigar. How about you, George? Did you have the uh, another Will Wednesday? I'm going to tap that out. I have to say that, you know, now you have this feeling that like, it's just a te it's a tedious thing to smoke. You're like, ah, uh, like if I was in my normal environment, like not doing the show, meaning if, if this would be one of those times when you're sm I'm just continue to smoke because you paid the money for it. So you want to get as much out of it as you can. And Tony says those SP 1014s are getting a lot of favor. Oh, nice. Yeah. The one that I had that, that, that um, Rusty gave me probably must be about almost a year ago. Oh, it was a year ago when, when you were up here for the for the hundred fifty the hundredth anniversary, which was this past week. Um, that smoked really, really well. I'm really, really, I'm really, really surprised. Yeah, the struggle is definitely real. Definitely. <laughs> Brian says the Agonorsa Anniversary Lancero white label. It's good. All right. Excellent. Excellent. So what bar, what uh, cigar lounge did you guys end up at, Brian? Yeah, it's definitely, Tony, it's definitely a struggle. It definitely feels like a struggle at this point. Oh, you did make it to Ambassador. Ambassador. I wonder what that place looks like. I noticed that when I was punching into Google, the um, Ambassador also has a location in Michigan. Is that related to them or... Oh, locations. Paradise Valley, Glendale, Surprise, or Peoria. Oh, wow. That is nice. Is this the one you're, you're at? Oh, that's pretty dope. Uh, 
I like that. Byron at a bit. Oh, the Byrons are kind of nice. I like those. Padron, Tatuaje. Newest El Septimo. Oh, that might be interesting. These El Septimos might be interesting. Oh, nice cutters. Nice. That's actually quite nice. Oh, yeah. Kind of southwestern. Nice. How's the... um? Oh, Tony wants to know, Brian, gold, silver, or foil? Well, gold or silver, or is it new? Silver with white background. And Stevens having the LFD double A hero Maduro is hitting the spot tonight. Excellent, excellent. No smoke, so great ventilation. Gosh, you guys are living well, living well. Oh, here's their 360 humidor. Whoa. Clay, Gray Cliff, Atabe, Byron, Davidoff. Oh. Mm, this is dope. Well, that's it. Oh, yeah, that's nice. That's really nice. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, lockers too, huh? Nice. Any idea what the locker cost is at that place? And then a private room. Now oh, that's really, that's really quite nice. So where are you guys in this lounge? Is that you, Brian, right there? Is that you? <laughs> All right. Oh, this must be the other ambassador. Not as nice. Or is that another part of the building? Oh, I like the wainscoting. Oh, that's the entryway. Nice. Oh, that is pretty. Oh, so this is the lounge area here. Is that correct? Oh, yeah, that was the lounge side. Nice. Looks like what? Maybe 2,500 square feet? And lockers are $375 a year. Oh, not bad. Not bad. Are there any um, privileges with the locker, or is that a membership, or what's that? What are the details surrounding that? Again, we've got a little bit of uneven burn happening. I don't know if that's because I'm smoking it hard or not, but I'm really smoking it hard just to get through it. We're in the big lounge, not the member lounge. So I'm going to presume that... Or is it safe to presume that this would be the regular lounge and this is the member lounge? This is the member lounge? That, that's kind of worth being a member. Even if you're there for a week. Well, either way, that's, 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 some, nice, that's some nice digs. Oof. Yeah, look at that. Why is it burning uneven? Okay, maybe that's better. At least it's burning evenly. All right, I guess we can, I guess we're at the point where we can get our full scoring going on. Let's 
zoom in a little bit more here. I mean, the flavor really is kind of a, I'm going to say it's the same. I'm, maybe that's being a little bit generous. I'm going to say it's eight. The burn has been a little bit low. The draw has been very good. I'll say seven, five for that. Consistency. It's been consistent, but I wouldn't say it's consistently great. Seven, five. Overall, I'm going to say seven, five. Let's do some calculations on this thing. We've got 7.5 plus 7.5 plus 8 plus 7 plus 8 plus 7 plus 8 plus 15, 7.5. So ooh, even, even lower than what? Even lower than what George was uh, predicting. That's a shame. Let's have a look at our scoring here. Oh, gosh. You don't even need to. Uh... So our 20, actually, it's technically, I think our 25th rated cigar, because there's two of them up here that are 87s. And 8525. So I think that gives us like the 25th cigar of the year. Oh, uh, well, you know. Oops. Ryan says that the last picture is the big lounge. Remember, lounge last track to me, but 24. Oh. Oh, oh, okay. Last picture is the big lounge. So this is the big lounge that does not have 24-hour access. So I'm, I'm going to presume then that this is the lounge that's members only with the uh, with the 24-hour access. That would make sense. I mean, it's not – in case something does happen, it would be you – know, they wouldn't have so much to repair as they would with this lounge. All right, there it is. Our um, the J London Telephone Booth Series Three, seven five five. Unfortunately, that is the lowest ranked cigar so far of the year. Was hoping it was going to be better. But anyway, all right. So I guess that's going to be it for this week. Thank you guys for tuning in. Always great to see all of you. Um, next week is going to be hopefully the 20th anniversary of the My Father Cigar. George is going to come up, bring those with us so we can try those. They actually come out on Friday. So hopefully they arrive to his shop and he can bring them up here with us next week. And we'll have that. And then I think that's a great idea to do an outdoor movie session. So. Let's uh, look around, probably hope for the middle of September, maybe just do a Saturday. Everyone can come up and hang out and we'll just hang out and eat and drink and whatever. All right. So I guess that's going to be it. Thank you guys very much for tuning in. Appreciate you being here another Thursday. Back again next week, Thursday at 8 p.m. as always. And uh, yeah, there it is. Thank you very much. And uh, see you next time.